Sowing season is here. What seeds will you be sowing? Maybe vegetables, herbs, flowers, cover crops, microgreens, or seeds for sprouting? Well, whatever kind of seed you are after, True Leaf Market has you covered. True Leaf Market's been supplying superb seed since 1974. And you can expect swift delivery and a fantastic choice of crops to grow. Check out trueleafmarket.com for a superb selection of seeds, plus tons of free advice, including their downloadable guides to microgreens, herb growing and more. You can get $10 off at trueleafmarket.com now when you spend $50 using code on the ledge 10. That's $10 off with code on the ledge 10. Hello and welcome to Legends of the Leaf. No, actually, well, yes, welcome to Legends of the Leaf. I'm talking about my book here today, but this is On the Ledge podcast. Maybe I made a mistake putting the word ledge in everything I do. Uh, well, that's something to ponder over when I'm awake in the night. <laughs> Hello! If you hadn't guessed already, publishing a book is an exciting but also discombobulating process. And in another Legends of the Leaf focused episode today, I'm going to be talking to the person that illustrated my book. That's the lovely Helen Entwistle. And we'll be discussing all kinds of stuff from how we collaborated to the people in our families that inspired us. Plus, I answer a question about worm juice. Mm, mm, mm. Well, Legends of the Leaf is officially out on April the 27th, 2023. But because so many of you lovely people pledged for the book, you may already have a copy in your hands. And thank you to everybody who's been talking about it on social media. It's been really great to get your feedback. And as a gift to my Patreons in episode 110 of An Extra Leaf, my bonus podcast out now, you can hear me reading chapter two of the book about Alo Vera. Bit of housekeeping before we get on with the interview. Thank you, Michael S. from the US for your lovely review of the show. And a tad of newsletter news. I've decided to simplify my newsletter offering. I'm going to produce one newsletter every Friday. It's going to be called The Plant Ledger and it's going to incorporate news from all the things I do, including the podcast, houseplant news from around the globe and anything else that catches my planty eye. If you want to subscribe... Just visit my website, janeperone.com and click on the plant ledger link in the top right hand corner. One of the great things about doing Legends of the Leaf was I had a really clear vision of what I wanted the book to be. And part of that vision was illustrations. I didn't want photography. I wanted gorgeous illustrations. And so I turned to Helen Entwistle. And I decided it would be a great opportunity to look back with her and discuss how she went about creating the illustrations of the book and how we worked together. We recorded this shortly before we actually got copies of the book. So that's why we're talking about not yet having seen it. But I really do hope you enjoy this chat and get a deeper insight into Legends of the Leaf. Welcome to the podcast. It's an exciting time for us both because this has been a long time in the making, hasn't it, this book? Oh, it has. Yes. The pandemic time is all a bit hazy to me, but uh, it's been 
I think it was September 2020 when we launched this project for the crowdfunding phase. But it must have been earlier that year during the real serious times of the pandemic that I first approached you about this book. Yes, it was that summer when everything was strange. Yeah, I know. What stands out for me about working on this book, though, compared to other projects I've done involving illustrations, and what's been so lovely is the fact that I've been able to work with you really closely on this book and actually interact with you during the process rather than just, um, you know, in other experiences I've had where you don't have so much of that interaction. Well, I'd say we were in touch daily when we were in the thick of it, weren't we? Just every day communicating about where we were up to. And you were absolutely going for it because (laughs) because you had a real deadline, a a genuine deadline, more serious (laughs) than my deadline. Can you tell listeners what that was? So I was getting bigger and bigger as the the pages of the book were being completed. (laughs) I think I finished it when I was eight and a half months pregnant. Yes, I'd say I was just, I was eight and a half months pregnant and I was two weeks out of morning sickness. Oh, wow. So I had that for, well, the whole pregnancy. It was just a a constant that was there. So drawing these pictures, that was just, that's what kept me sane because I was feeling sick that entire time. Oh, that's awful. It kept me sane, Jane. It kept me sane. That's really good to hear. I mean, that is the worst. I mean, I only had morning sickness for the first part of my pregnancies and not very badly at all. And I can't imagine how much of a pain it must be to feel sick all the time so far into the pregnancy. So that's amazing. I'm glad it was helpful. Oh, it was. (laughs) (laughs) But now you're on the other side of it and you have a delightful child who is, um, sounds wonderful. So it's all worked out for the good in the end. But it was a a really fascinating process to work with you on this book. But let's just step back a bit. Can you tell me a little bit about your career as an illustrator and what other projects you've worked on and where this all began? Well, so where did this begin? Well, I suppose talking about me before before working with you or before I knew you, I've been an illustrator now for how long? At least 15 years I've been doing this. My main my main focus is screen printing. I am predominantly a printmaker. Um, and I, I print commission pieces for anyone who, who contacts me to ask that sort of work. I, I make my own product range. Um, I've worked on the odd bit of illustrative work for, for print in terms of magazines and books, but it's mostly commission work and my own products that I print. And one of those products was a seed saver envelope, which several years ago, you contacted me about those when you were working at The Guardian. And that's when our relationship began. Um, so I've screen printed all sorts of stationary pieces and plants and the natural world is a real big part of that. Stemming from a children's toy I have that was my mum's in the 60s. I don't know if you're familiar with this, Jane. It's called Floral Miniature Garden oh. from the 1960s. Do you know this? No. Oh my goodness. Well, I'll send you some pictures of mine. It's a kit where you build your own garden with plants and greenhouses very much of its time, late 50s, early 60s, made by Britons Limited. Floral miniature garden. It's absolutely amazing. So did you play with that when you were uh, little? Not so much little. I'd say as a teenager. I don't think my mum would have let us near when we were little. It's it's it is a bit brittle these days, but the the illustrated packaging and the how to books that come with it are just my cup of tea. A very beautiful mid century illustration, which is kind of where I started when I was doing my degree. This is what interests me. This is an aesthetic that I absolutely love, and I can produce through the method of screen prints. So those seed saver envelopes, when we first were in touch, that product there is where it all began for me with my product range, really. That's when things kind of took off. And that's what I've been doing ever since, drawing drawing anything and everything and screen printing it. That's interesting that you remember that being our first contact. I'd forgotten all about that, but that's that. Now you've said it, I'm like, yes, that <laughs> is. That's right. That's right. And I, I too love the mid-century aesthetic. I think this is probably mm. a large part of the reason why I picked you out to do the illustrations 
because, you know, I collect mid-century China, a midwinter design, which is a, a brilliant design, which has got stars on it and lines, which is exactly the mid-century aesthetic, basically, or part of it, and the shape as well of the of the China. So I, it's an era that I really love, and I love the aesthetic too. So I think that's probably why I thought of you first. And I did think of you first for the illustrations. And the wonderful thing about this book was because it was done the way it was done, I was able to have massive editorial control in terms of choosing you and picking out illustrators. I think I had about three illustrators in mind and I sort of narrowed it down looking at people's work. And I think I chose you, as I say, because I just thought Helen will be able to deliver something that I like, but that is also really fresh and unique because I didn't want it to look like all the other plant illustrations that I had seen. There is a lot of work that is quite samey out there that has the same kind of feel to it. And I think you've created something really fresh and original. So pat on the back to you. It's, it did push me in certain respects because, um, well, my plan the whole time, Jim, was to screen print every every plant and then get a good high res scan or photograph of that print. But in the very beginning, I realised that was not going to be possible because I, if I'm in screen printing position, I'm slightly leant forward. So I've got this bump on me that's getting bigger and bigger and I feel sick. I'm thinking, this is not going to happen. I can't screen print these illustrations. So it really pushed me to find a new method of producing something that felt like a screen print but wasn't quite so I combined um, a digital element into my practice which I hadn't done before so it, it made me do something new and I came up with a method that I really enjoyed it was great that's really interesting to hear and you know when you have those kind of practical limitations you come yeah. up, you come up with I mean I was constantly amazed by how productive you were during that period where I was really struggling at that point with writing my manuscript and every as you say every day you'd be messaging me saying I've done this how's this and discussing different <laughs> different um plants so it was really encouraging for me to have to see how well you were getting on with it um and obviously working towards your own particular deadline with your pre- pregnancy yeah and I also wanted to give listeners an insight into how we did this because I think again this is probably quite unique in that so I as I said my requirement was that the illustrations looked really fresh and different but I also wanted them to be accurate like to yeah so people could look at it and think not that the plant looked was was too I didn't want it to be too stylized I wanted it to be kind of realistic and I think that's what uh why it was so good that I was able to send you a load of inspiration images for each of the 25 plants and also then you were able to come back and kind of ask me questions and and so on um was that tricky though dealing with those my demands basically no no that that was like the starting point for me and it kind of gave me a focus right right okay this is this is like the the plant from this angle or this particular um oh I've forgotten the word I'm gonna what's it called um Feed is not the right word, Jane. Like you will know the terminology. Which, Which variety? variety of plants we're drawing? Variety, not breed. <laughs> we're talking plants, not dogs. Yeah. So, though your your starting points for me kind of set me on the right track, I would then go to my house of plants and see: Have I got this plant? Yes, I've got that one. Or no, I've not. And if I if I had it, then I'd get that plant on my desk and draw it from every angle and get as many details out of it as I could. If I didn't have the plant, I went to my local garden centre, Abby and Tom's, went down there, had a good look at the plants, because they had them all. Or I went to the House Plant Expert book and had a look in there too, because those illustrations, uh, they're of their time, but they're very accurate, and I love the colours of them. Yeah, well, of course, that's also a massive influence on me, so that's good to hear that you were um, were sort of being inspired by that. And, in fact, the the standby cover that we had for the crowdfunding, I don't know if listeners picked up on this, possibly this was way too niche, but the yellow square in the centre with the text that was my sort of I asked for that specifically I said can we have that yellow because that was my hat tip to the houseplant expert by Dr David Hasean so I wanted to get that in there I know people really like that standby standing cover but I think the final cover we've ended up with is also well is is just perfectly 
brilliant for the book because it's got your illustrations. Um, so I'm really pleased with that too. Yeah, it, it, it's turned out really well. I'm really excited to see it in real life. <laughs> I know. I can't. We, at this point when we're recording, the book is being printed and I don't have a copy and neither do you, uh, which feels a little bit scary. But we will <laughs> hopefully <laughs> by the time this recording goes out, we will have an actual copy in our hands, which is really, really exciting. And it, in a way, crowdfunding, I, I don't know how you feel about the crowdfunding stage. It was very, very hard, but it was also lovely because I had so much support from friends and family and people I'd never met. And I, I could see sometimes with the pledges coming in that it was like, oh, that must be somebody of Helen's fa- Helen's family. Yeah. Suddenly you'd put something out and there was a, a rush of pledges. A so it was nice. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that stage. It was nerve wracking thinking, will it happen? Won't it happen? It will happen. It might not happen. Constant uncertainty. But the further on it went, we thought, yeah, this is going to happen. It was it was it was quite a lot of work. But I really enjoyed it. It was it was really good, um, and pr- producing the screen print that I created for one of those pledges, I absolutely loved that. I pushed myself there quite a lot. It was a seven color print, which I've not printed in that many colors for a long time, and I, I loved every minute of it. I thought I'll get this in before I'm too pregnant and I can still print, and it was <laughs> really really enjoyable. And what are the challenges with with illustrating plants in particular? The brief here, we, we had to have something that looked, you, you'd quickly glimpse it, oh, sorry, quickly look at the plant and you'd know what plant it was. It needed to resemble the plant quite accurately. So for me, it was down to quite often the leaves the, and the leaf structure and making those leaves look just like they should do, as if you were looking at the actual plant, but still with the hand-drawn element in there too. So for me, it was accuracy, getting them accurate. That was the challenge. But the more I drew, the more my brain seemed to just hone in on the accurate shape of each leaf. And I'd say what early on, what did I draw early on? Who did we draw early on? So Kentia Palm was early. Those leaves were a challenge because they needed to be very accurate or they could easily look like something else. And then later on, Ivy. Um, Ivy, oh, Eva. Eva is the name I've got in my mind for that Ivy plant. I think that was the right. Can you remember what the Ivy was that we drew? Oh, was it? Uh, that's a really good question. I've got my sketchbook here. I'm going to flip through this. Yeah, do flip through. I mean, it's interesting with the ivy because that brings us on to the the pot choices, really, because, again, I think this is one of the unique things about the book, that we were able to bring something really personal. And probably 95% of of readers will never be aware of this, but it means something to us, which is great, which is that when we chose those pots for the illustrations, they weren't just from your imagination or are they all pots that either you or I owned that we that you use for the illustrations? Just glancing over them all being upon the wall here. But yes, apart from the jar from the Marimo Moss Ball. Oh, uh, yeah. So that was just, well, actually, that was a jar of pickles I had in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this I love it. Jar. That's what that is. So, yeah, it's still oh, that's good. technically something I had in the house, but it was in the fridge yeah. full of gherkins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of, and some of the, those pots are ones that are pictures I sent you. And uh, I mean, I, as I say, I love China. And some of those pots are ones that I've had from years, mostly picked up from charity shops and jumble sales and things that I absolutely love. And so for me, it makes it quite special looking at those pictures and recognising that pot or this pot that I've loved and I still have and I still use for plants. So that's another aspect that I think makes it really unique as a project. Definitely. I I love drawing the pots as much as the plant, to be honest, because we did have a bit of a narrative going there. It was either a pot of of your choice or mine. And I remember you sent me a selection. I said, just send me some pots, Jane. So you'd photograph lots from around your house. So if I found one that looked like it was going to suit that particular plant, like that's the one we went for. So I I do like that we have that personal connection to these pots. Absolutely. And I think that even if people don't know that, I think that will somewhat come across in the drawings. I I sometimes think, wonder whether illustrating plants is kind of, there's a sort of um, a deadening effect of caused by botanical illustrations in that, you know, those botanical illustrations are beautiful. And I love, I love botanical illustrations, but sometimes I feel like there's this idea that we have to go down that particular route for illustrating plants 
or else go for something very, very abstract and very, very, very sort of um, minimalist. And I think in a way, what you've done is create something that is just a different category of plant illustration. And that's what I love about the book. I think it was also quite possibly quite a bold decision not to have any photos in the book. Well, that that is quite an intimidating prospect for me. I've got to make these images that look enough like the real thing to then be sort of a reference point for people looking and reading about that plant. So I suppose in terms of botanical illustration and something a bit more abstract, we're kind of right in the middle. We've got the flat colour of something abstract along with the accuracy of something botanical. The colours are also really impactful. I mean, I haven't sent you the um, PDF proofs of the whole book yet, but I will do. And what you'll see from that is that the colours from the illustrations have been drawn into the fonts, uh, or not the fonts so much as the the graphics on the page, right? which are quite minimalist, but still the the colours come through. So I think the chapter headings where you've got the name of the plant, they've drawn the colours for each of those from the illustrations. So I that I really like, and it's not like, it doesn't feel like a sort of a jumble of colour, it's still predominantly black text, but there are these little shots of the colours which match the illustrations. So I think that's quite nice as well. Sounds good, sounds subtle, I like it. from my chat with Helen shortly but now it's time for question of the week which comes from Alice and it concerns wormery juice. Now this is not your latest health drink fad I'm glad to say but something plant related. If you haven't come across wormery juice before it's also known as vermicomposting leachate. What on earth is vermicomposting? Well it's just a fancy way of saying worm composting and The leachate just means the juice that comes out of the bottom of the wormery uh, as it works its magic. Though the liquids that accumulate at the bottom of a wormery system. What's a wormery? Well, it's a specialist form of composting where you're using worms that stack on, you know, decomposing material. Usually this is stuff from your kitchen waste like potato peelings and apple cores that kind of thing and the worms snack away in their bin like structure and end up producing the worm poos which are used in various ways and they're called worm casts but also this leachate which is a brown liquid that comes out the bottom of the wormery and is usually delivered to you via a tap which in my experience usually gets blocked I've had a wormery for many, many years and I absolutely love it. If you're a wormery geek, mine is a worm cafe and I have some extra trays for it. And I highly recommend this. The only thing that's gone wrong is the tap has broken, which I think is pretty common on wormeries. The tap is the vulnerable point. So like water butt taps, they often do break. I produce quite a bit of this worm leachate, uh, probably, I don't know, a couple of pints every month, I'd say, and I use it a lot in my garden, but I don't use it on my house plants. Alice wonders if this is something that I could be using on an indoor plant collection. What's in the leachate? And is it something that you could use to provide nutrients for your plants? Well, I think the first thing to say about the leachate is it's going to be, how can I put this? It's going to be irregular, I guess is the right word. Its composition is going to depend on the mix of kitchen waste that you're going to put into your wormery and its qualities will vary in terms of things like pH, how alkaline or acidic it is and levels of sodium and the levels of the different major nutrients which are nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. Obviously if you are using a proprietary houseplant feed it's always going to be exactly the same, provided that you dilute uh, and apply it correctly according to the instructions. But with this leachate, you are going to get variation from batch to batch, something definitely to bear in mind if you're thinking of using it on your houseplants. Because if you're using it in the garden, of course, there will be other factors coming in. Uh, Rain will be coming down and dispersing any excess, for example, sodium that might be in a particular batch. Whereas in your house plants, there's nowhere for that 
to go if there is a problem, say, with the acidity or with too much sodium. This leachate is what you'd call an organic fertiliser or a natural fertiliser, sometimes people call it. Um, Not very meaningful terms in many ways, but what it essentially means is it's something made from plant or animal materials where the nutrients are in organic form. Uh, And other examples of organic fertilisers you might have used include things like bone meal, liquid comfrey feeds and seaweed feeds, either in liquid form or in meal form. The fact that these nutrients are organic means that they're not automatically going to be available to the plant's roots. The vast majority of those nutrients will have to be broken down by microorganisms in the soil to turn them into something that plants can actually make immediate use of. And what that means for you is if you're somebody who uses things like pesticides on your soil, even occasionally, you're going to be compromising the microorganism community in your soils and therefore you may find that you're applying an organic fertilizer and it's not making any difference because there's not enough microorganisms to do that work for you. And that's why we use synthetic fertilizers. These, the nutrients come in forms that plants can immediately take up and use without the involvement of microorganisms. It's possible to use organic fertilizers on houseplants, just provided that you're keeping that microorganism mix really rich in the soil. And if you go back and listen to my episode 214 and 215 with soil scientist Ashley Essekin, you'll find out more about how to create a really rich network of microorganisms in your soil. Now, when it comes to wormery leachate, The advice is always that it needs to be diluted and the dilution rate suggested varies. If I was using them on houseplants, I would aim for one part leachate to 10 parts water. It's a bit of an inexact science because the strength, as I say, is going to vary. But that's usually what's recommended. Give it a sniff. It shouldn't smell terrible. If it does smell terrible, I probably wouldn't use it. There is a risk with the leachate that it's going to be carrying pathogens which are potentially harmful to you and your plants. Anything that smells really bad is probably a bad idea to add because there's a higher chance that it does contain pathogens. Again, if you're using it in the garden, there's a lot more kind of buffers in terms of the plants being able to reach their roots out to other areas of the soil and receive rainwater and so on. But in the house, your house plants are entirely dependent on you. And, you know, even within the worm community, and there is one, um, there's disagreement about what to use this leachate for and how useful it is. Uh, Personally, I wouldn't use it on anything uh, that I'm planning to eat the plant. But uh, and I, as I say, I'm not going to be using it on my house plants. If you've got a wormery, that probably means you've got an outdoor space. And if you've got an outdoor space, you can use the wormery leachates on those outdoor plants and keep to something proprietary for your house plants because then you know exactly what they're getting. And by the way, if you're getting a huge amount of leachate coming out of your wormery that probably means that something's gone wrong either the lid's not on properly and lots of water's getting in or there's not enough bedding for the worms i add things like ripped up cardboard um, to add bedding to the wormery sometimes people use coir blocks rehydrated in water as well so too much leachate probably means there is some issue with your wormery being out of balance I have seen some analysis of leachate and it does seem to have a reasonable mix of the major nutrients. But in the case that was tested, the sodium content was a little bit high and I think the pH was uh, about 8.5, which is the alkaline end of the normal scale for tap water. So not appalling by any means, but if you had an acid loving plant, then that might provide a problem if you're using the leachate on it over the long term. If you do want to use wormery products on your plants, many, many substrates for houseplants do come with a content of worm casts or you can buy worm casts directly and it's a bit more expensive, but these will have been screened for pathogens so you can get that wormy goodness into your houseplants without having to worry about pathogens and there's also lots of other organic fertilizers that you can use um, which work well on house plants given the caveats i've already said about keeping the soil fauna 
uh, very lively. You could use seaweed meal or, or liquid seaweed, but I would maybe recommend also using synthetic fertilizers just occasionally, uh, particularly if your plant maybe doesn't seem to be growing its best. So that's my opinion, but I'd love to know yours. Do you use worm leachate on your houseplants and how do they grow? Do let me know. It's on the ledge podcast at gmail.com, which is the same place to send your questions. Now it's time to go back to my chat with Helen and we're talking about some of our favourite houseplants from the book. Helen, are there any plants from the book that you particularly love or have any nostalgic memories of from the past? The Hoya Carnosa, my, I, that is the first houseplant I ever remember as my grandma had one. And my mum ah. still... My mum still has that plant. That is a plant that oftentimes people talk about as being a plant that they remember from their childhood from a relative's house because it's such a heritage plant. And yeah, it's one that lots of people will identify with in that way. I think probably for me, the plant that I would say is most memorable from my childhood, well, there's several, but one of them has to be the Swiss cheese plant, Monstra Deliciosa, because in my doctor's surgery, uh, it was a, it was a, like a new build, sort of 1960s building with this really high ceiling and this high atrium. And I'd be sitting, waiting to go and see the doctor. And there would be this, what at the time to me as a child seemed massive Swiss cheese plant going up <laughs> the wall where you would wait. Because back in the day, before you had these modern things, I don't know if you had this at your doctor's surgery, it'd be like a board and a name of a doctor and then a flashing, a light and a different colours. Yes. And it would go, yes. and you'd see it flash yeah. and you'd know that was your turn. <laughs> so yeah. I'd be sitting there waiting for the the light to flash for Dr. Gallagher, who was my childhood doctor. And I'd be sitting there looking at this plant. And I remember thinking, where is that from? What on earth how on earth why has it got those splits and holes in it and just being really fascinated by it and the other thing that I remember clearly is probably the spider plant such a classic plant I don't know if we had one at home but certainly uh, we had a sort of I guess a slightly unusual school in that there were lots of plants in it and me and my friend Ruth Watson used to get let out of maths to go and water the spider plants in the library. I mean, I don't know whether that would happen today. It seems very um, relaxed. But yeah, we I must have shown some interest in plants. So me and Ruth Watson used to go off and water all these spider plants in the library. And they were all like really kind of wizened looking specimens. They really did need some help. But we used to go and water all these plants. I think we had a spider plant at my primary school too it wasn't in the library but it was on a high ledge in a corridor that led to the head teacher's office and I remember the babies hanging down off it are they called babies the little plants we well, can the call babies. them yeah you can call them babies yeah yeah absolutely I think you know so many people have spider plant memories and again that was and then that was my primary school and then at my middle school I mean, again, this was kind of, I don't know if this was unusual, but between classrooms, we had this greenhouse, this... Oh, wow. It was like a lean-to glass structure that, in this school, which um, was full of cacti, absolutely full of cacti. And I remember being absolutely fascinated by it. And there was lots of um, mothers of thousands, those ca- calancos with all the little babies on the oh, leaf yes. edges. And... Yeah, it was it was just for me at the time, you know, nickname botany at school. (laughs) um, It was a really fascinating place. So though, but those probably from the book, those two are the ones that stand out for me. And, you know, it it took me many years, actually, to eventually have my own Swiss cheese plant. I mean, now I have three. But at the time, it took me a long time to actually get one. And it wasn't a plant that we ever had at home. But I do hear from a lot of people who associate them with an auntie or a grandma having them in their front room and them just being a fixture so again this is this is part of the tapestry that I wanted to bring into the book of like telling these stories of these plants the reasons we have plants I suppose the memories they conjure so the Hoya Carnosa I can picture that in in my granny's bungalow in the living room on the table in front of a window and a net curtain, I can picture it. Um, my mum's mum, that is, Winnie, she was a collector. So I can picture plants everywhere, but it's only the 
Hoya that I can see, but I can see cupboards full of ornaments and trinkets. She was a, an amazing lady, fascinating. And I think that's probably where my collector's thing, my magpie eye comes from, collecting things. And I collect all sorts of things, and I suppose plants are one of them. Um, and that comes from her and her magical house full of treasures. <laughs> that's that's wonderful. I love those kind of stories. They're so special. Many of us have got those relatives who had an influence on our gardening lives. And I remember my previous book about allotments, That a lot of that was, I think, I can't remember if I dedicated it to him, but my granddad, unfortunately, I was too, he was too old by the time I knew him, but he still had beefsteak tomatoes but he had five allotment plots built his own greenhouses including their own boiler heating systems and had this amazing plot so I was very much inspired by by him and he was massively tall perhaps I'll put a picture of him in the show notes for this episode he was massively tall which um, I certainly didn't inherit nor of my children but he was really really tall and my nanny was tiny like absolutely tiny so there's a brilliant picture of them standing outside the back door with my granddad and my nanny like just the height difference is just amazing but you know real they were real uh, you know just classic working class people who my granddad was completely self-taught taught himself right. everything and just created this incredible allotment site so well I, I can remember my granddad's brother um uncle norman we called him he had a, a massive allotment plot in lancaster and we'd go over and visit him and auntie elsie so and auntie elsie actually was very short and uncle norman was really tall maybe that's the thing of the past i don't know <laughs> <laughs> and their allotment plot was magical. And that to me was a, a connection to my granddad, who I, I never got to meet my granddad, my mum's dad. I knew my dad's dad, Ron, very well. He's he was a painter, so that's an element there of my um, personal history, which I think I think my grandparents, in some respects, helped form me. So my, my dad's dad was a painter. A wallpaper and decorator, but also a painter of all sorts of subjects, mostly trees and birds and animals. And my mum's parents, Winnie and my granddad's name, Cedric Albert Can. So I, I never got to meet him. He sadly died when my mum was uh, about 13. But he he sounded like an amazing man. Um, and I've, I've heard of a lot of him over my life and grown up in um in Chorley in Lancashire next to Astley Park where my mum grew up as a child in Astley Hall as my granddad Cedric was the superintendent of all the parks in Chorley so he, he looked after all of the recreational grounds and the parks and he trained I think if if I'm remembering this right he was very early training at Kew in the early 1930s he had the senior certificate from Kew and he also, what else did he do? He was trained as a teacher in cottage gardening. Um, and he was part of the Dig for, for Victory campaign in the 30s. Um, he was on the board of lecturers that informed that. And he's, he won various awards at Kew for his, um, for his botany knowledge. And he worked there as well in the tropical gardens. He's, he, he's done all sorts. And so whenever I go home, my mum and dad live right next to the park. We go into the park and there's trees that he planted, a beautiful cedar tree, which he put there. Um, and it, as my mum said, it's quite out of keeping with, with the other trees in the park. I, I really want to ask him why he put it there, because I'm sure there's a reason for it. And um, he managed all of the gardens and the greenhouses. And the, there was a huge walled garden allotment. And he looked after that. I wish I could have met him. He sounded like an amazing man. Wow. It's amazing when you dig back and those that horticultural heritage, I'm sure, has its place. Yeah, well, I suppose the, the last connection that just springs to mind is um, as the superintendent of the parks, he had various pieces of stationery that he'd use for um, official letters, let, letter-headed paper, and erasers, little rubbers with his name, and then Spark Superintendent in this amazing font across the front. And I've got a little stack of those that I've had since I was a child, and I've collected erasers since I was about 10. And I think it's because of that one of his, this magical little piece of history I have that somehow links me to my granddad. 
I think that's that leads to another collection of mine and why that ever began. Yeah. Yeah, our, our collections are collections are, are good. I mean, as you know, in fact, I have uh, my brooch collection, which is quite large, does include a brooch from you, which is wonderful. Oh, yes. and I, no, two brooches from you, actually. Uh, one one made by you and one given to, given um, by you to me. And I do wear those brooches um, regularly. I'll have to, again, dig out a picture. Um, well, I've... And I do love a plant brooch. Oh, me too. I don't have enough plant brooches. I've got a few and they're very special, I've, but I've got... Um, a multitude of different themes in my brooch collection. I've already picked out which one I'll wear for the book launch, Jane. Oh, have you? Well, that's something I need to think about. It's going to have to be plant related, obviously. Well, what I might do, actually, the other thing from the book that I've tried to, uh, that I'm trying to promote is in the Hoya chapter, funnily enough, I talk about how in Victorian times, Hoya flowers were really popular as buttonholes. And I did actually buy myself a silver buttonhole holder brooch one of those little mini vases so if I have what I'll have to do if I have Hoya flowering which I may or may not do for either the launch that we're going to do online or the one in person I'll have to try and get some uh, blooms in there uh for that yeah I think a few stars are gonna have to align for that to happen aren't they I know I know I'm just thinking I don't know if any of my Hoyas are going to be in bloom then it's really probably unlikely but you never know later in the year I'll definitely do it um for for a flower show or something but I'm trying to get people to wear buttonholes again they're not just for weddings they can be everyday attire have a little bit of flower or or foliage on your person I know obviously you've got a young child now so presumably your work has been curtailed by parenthood but do you have any other projects in mind for the future? I'm not working at the moment in a in much sense of work at all I'm trying little bits and pieces here and there when I've got enough energy in the evenings because I am on full full time childcare responsibilities at the moment. However, from my desk here where I sit, I can see the f- the front garden here. I've got a big stack of woods and I'm going to be making some raised beds soon to start my allotment plot which is a project I've been trying to get off the ground for four years now it's happening this year and I'm going to illustrate it as I go so that is something that is on on my mind I'll be illustrating my allotment from the day one. Oh, that sounds lovely well that's very appropriate I've got my allotment keeper's handbook at the ready, Jen. Yes, I was just going to say, I happen to have written a book about this because my <laughs> first book was about oh. allotments, the allotment keeper's handbook. Yeah, well, there you go. And I have to say, that was a book. In a way, this is why I went for the control freak approach to my second book, because with the first book, like normally happens with publishing, I didn't really have a say over the cover or the illustrations either. So, um, yeah. Oh, that's good. That's wonderful. What a wonderful project. And I imagine... Uh, that that will be nice to do something again whether you've got this personal inspiration coming in Mm, yes so I'm not sure where it's going to take me but I can see a product range coming out of it and some kind of journal that I will keep and maybe a set of illustrations that I could screen print and I'm going to get my my little boy involved with it from the beginning so he can learn learn about plants Oh, that sounds amazing. And the screen printing technique, is is screen printing going through a renaissance right now? Oh, I, I don't know what's going on in the world, really, in terms <laughs> of creating <laughs> moment, Jane. I just feel like I'm a bit out out of it. Um, I would say manual printmaking on every method of printmaking out there has been pretty popular now for the last decade or so. And um, there's so much digital work out there and a lot of people their primary focus is to work digitally so there's been a huge resurgence in handmade methods back to hands-on work um, mixing inks finding out ways of putting that ink on paper to make a piece of work which which isn't then relying on a digital um, tool to draw onto a screen I'd say for me it's just I, I need that element in my work. It, there's not enough ta- 
Is tactility a word? Probably not. It's not tactile enough for me to then just draw digitally and then the outcome is digital. There's got to be something more to it. Um, and I think a lot of people feel the same. So yeah, I'd, I'd say printmaking's had a resurgence. That felt like quite a convoluted way of saying that to you, but yes. That is really interesting. And I totally get what you're saying about the physical, um, the physical work involved. And like so many creative endeavours and like houseplants, you're using a bit of science, you're using art, you're using your practical skills and history is coming into it as well. There's just so many layers to what you do. Absolutely. And also, we haven't talked about dogs yet. I'm not saying this was the entire, <laughs> entire reason why I hired you to do this project, but you do also have a skinny dog like me. Yours is a bit bigger, though. A uh, long lady, yes. So I have um, a retired um, racing greyhound, Belle. She'll be Aww. 10 years old later this year. And she's just Aww. absolutely lovely. Yeah, she's, well, she's quite grey now, but she's a big black grey white socks and a little white tummy and a very grey face they're wonderful wonderful dogs i'm sure she's just like wolfish she'll just lay around day and she's just happy to be with you and with my little boy jay she's absolutely amazing they make a good pair yes they are they are really great with children and they you're, you're right they are the 100 mile an hour couch potato most of the time they're just lying about they're fantastic dogs they really are Whenever I see someone's profile on Instagram and I see they've got, you know, a Whippet or a Lurcher or a Greyhound, I'm like, yeah, they're okay. <laughs> they are the, the underrated dog of the dog world, I would say. They are. Absolutely. Yeah. One of the best things I ever did was adopt a Greyhound. Um, Belle, Belle is number three for us and we'll always have one. They're just, they're just gentle souls and absolutely lovely pets. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. There's a little bit of a plug for the the retired greyhounds. They are amazing dogs. It's wonderful to talk to you. And I'm really excited about the book coming out. Is there anything else about it that we've forgotten to say? Where was I? I was talking about the ivy earlier, wasn't I? I found it. Oh, yeah. Heterohelix. Yeah, heterohelix. But I think it was probably a variegated one, wasn't it? Was it a cream and green one? Was it Glacier or something? I think it might be the cultivar Glacier. I've got Eva written here, which is... Oh, Eva. Okay. Yes. Does that ring a bell, Eva? It doesn't. No. (laughs) (laughs) But, oh, yes. No, there is one called Eva. Yes. Here we are. Eva. Yes. I mean, that's the other funny thing is that I don't know about you, but it does feel like the last three years have been a bit of a blur. Oh, yeah. And... I So lots of things are kind of forgotten to my memory. And I have opened up the proofs of the book and looked, read through and thinking, I have absolutely no memory of writing this. Oh, this is quite good. So <laughs> so um, it's going to be nice to have the actual copy uh, in my hands to kind of revisit all the stuff that I've written about in the book. And um, I mean, I'm sure you can't wait to see how the illustrations are going to actually turn out on the page. It's always a bit of a, I mean, it's a bit of an unknown, isn't it? It is. Um, I, I can't wait to see it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm nervous. I'm a bit apprehensive, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to it the colours, see how they turn out. Um, And the textures, we didn't talk about the textures. So behind each piece, I decided to add a little bit of a texture to a nice bold colour so that as you turn the page, you've got this this nice, nice, is that a good word to use? I'll go for it. There's nice, there's a plant with a nice simple background with a bit of texture. All those textures have come from surfaces, formica tabletops or plant pots. So there's, there's, a hidden layer of texture behind each plant. It's very much informed by this space where I spent all those months sitting drawing those plants. And actually, I should tell you, I've just screwed the handle back onto my um, my desk here because I was sitting here finding it really well. As that project went on, the desk was getting further away from me as the bump, my baby bump, was getting bigger. I had to unscrew the handle for my desk because it just dug into my stomach so much. <laughs> So I've just put it back on. I've got a, like a, a red 1950s school desk with a drawer for my top. And now it has a handle again because I've screwed it back on. I didn't know about that textures thing. That's really interesting. I love that. I really love that. And I think listeners will love it too. And readers of the book will love the fact that there's so much kind of real love and individuality gone into those illustrations. So um It's fantastic to hear that. And well, thank you. A massive thank you, Helen, for all your hard work at a time when really 
you could have been putting your feet up. You did a fantastic job and I'm just really excited with the final result. So thank you. Well, thanks so much for asking me to do it. You gave me a really good purpose at a time when I was in a bit of a a state of despair feeling so ill I could put that to one side and really just focus on drawing these beautiful plants and pots it was it was just what I needed thank you thank you so much to my guest Helen Entwistle And that is the end of this episode. I will be back next Friday when Legends of the Leaf will be out in the world. Woohoo! I think I'm allowed a small woohoo, aren't I? Have a fantastic week, whatever you're up to. And I hope you find the time for some quality time with your plants. The music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops, The Road We Used to Travel When We Were Kids by Komiku, and I Snossed I Lost by Dr. Turtle. And the ad music was Candlelight by Jazar. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit the show notes for details. (laughs) 